Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Analyzing Historic Photographs. I am Mike B and today we're going to be looking at one that's been suggested by many of you. I, I do listen to your suggestions in the comment section. Um, so we're going to be doing that if you haven't seen the thumbnail yet and can't figure it out from what I'm wearing. Um, I just wanted to start this off by saying thanks to everybody who's been supportive of this series. It's really cool for me to be able to do this. I enjoy the hell out of doing this because this is how I learn a lot about history and um, discussing certain photographs with friends and stuff. It's really cool. And that's how I'm hoping to be able to help educate people. And we'll get to that in a second. But another reason I like doing these videos is they're really easy for me to make. And if I can have something that I enjoy doing that's very easy and actually helps educate people on something that I'm very passionate about, that's a win for everyone, I think. So I'll try and keep this series going. Uh, and the educational part is very important because I've been contacted by a lot of educators that are at different levels that they teach at. And some of them are the comment sections of these videos and some of them my private message me and said, thank you for doing these because it is kind of um, alarming to them that a lot of younger people just can't, they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to analyze something. And it's not just a photograph. I mean, a photograph is one piece of history, even just a tangible item. It's the same concept of instead of just kind of going with today's society of look at something for five seconds and then it's, it's gone and then you don't, you don't look at it again because you're on to the next thing. Uh, it's kind of nice to be able to slow down and have these develop some skills on your own of being able to analyze historic stuff because it's critical thinking and it gets you past that initial phase of just, all right, move on to the next thing. It's like, no, let's really take a look at what's going on here. And photographs are a really good way to do that. So I'm going to show you the way I do it, just kind of looking at things. It doesn't mean it's the right way or the wrong way. It's just how I do it. You formulate your own way of uh, method of looking at photos and kind of having things jump out at you. I haven't really seen this one this much or as much, but it's not, there's not a total uh, lot going on, but it's a really cool photo and it can teach you some cool things about this particular time period. So my knowledge level on this subject, which is going to be Operation Desert Shield slash Desert Storm is fair. It's not, it's probably about a five out of 10 as far as what I know about this. So your knowledge level may be way higher or lower and uh, that doesn't matter. So if you do see something that you don't understand or you see something that I missed or got maybe incorrect, let me know in the comments to get some discussion going. That's how we learn and then it develops critical thinking. And then you'll be like, oh, well, that was fun to actually be able to pick that out and, you know, notice something that somebody else didn't. And then, oh, I learned that I didn't, I had missed it. So yeah, it's just, that's why I do these videos. So here's the photograph. So right away, you've got the iconic chocolate chip, six color desert camouflage pattern, which is why I'm wearing this. Um, I try to play dress up for the episodes that allows me to. I don't have a uniform from every time period or every conflict in every country, but the ones that I do, I'll play dress up because it pisses some people off, but I like doing it. It's a visual aid. And uh, anyway, so we can see right away, he's got the chocolate chip on, right? We'll start at the top and we'll go down. So you got the iconic Pazgit, right? This is the first major conflict the U.S. was in. I know they were used in other little con or smaller conflicts in the 1980s, but this was the most iconic first use of this new, you know, Stahlhelm inspired design of the Pazgit. And the world got to see what our new military looked like. This is kind of the beginning of the modern military, like going into the new millennium. And it was kind of symbolic and all that stuff. So you've got this camouflage that was designed in the 60s, but you've got this new technology. Now he's got a he's got a helmet band on a cat eye reflect or not a reflective band but a cat eye band, and he's got his name. I'm trying to see the rank. I, I haven't been able to. I haven't been able to like it gets blurry when I try to zoom in. It might be SSG. It might be SPC. Who knows? Anyway, and then it's his name, and those that looks to me because I don't I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. Like Fargo Mark, you watch these, I think. So if I'm wrong, I don't think that everybody got these foliage bands, these helmet bands in the first Gulf War, Desert Storm, sorry. I, I think this looks like it was either private purchase, and I know the sewing job was a private purchase thing, because that wasn't very common from what I've seen. And I could be wrong, because we go down and we see his unit a little bit on the left shoulder. He's the part of the 101st Airborne Division, so they're an active duty unit based out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and they might have had a different SO, or standard operating procedure, and they might have had access to different things. Now, we'll go back to the helmet and do something that is pretty iconic of a lot of uh, desert storm vets you see this in so many pictures you got the what's called we got in trouble for this stuff later on we got we get what's called the john waning of the chin strap right where you just kind of have your helmet on but you don't have your chin strap buckled this was a no-no later on but i can see why because the uh, two-point chin strap on the pasket was really not favorable if you fell or something like that to troops also it's sop or standard operating procedure when i say that sop that's what that means 
So maybe it wasn't a big no-no, and he doesn't look like he's actually, you know, in engaged in a firefight right now. Obviously, he's cleaning his M16A2, but we'll get to that. So it's just really interesting to me how he's got that, and it's in so many pictures I see. All right, so now on the left shoulder, we've got the first aid kit, and it looks like he's got a bandage in there. It's not a compass, otherwise it would be a little bit less uh, long, and it looks kind of like a pillow instead of a something heavy it's hard to explain but it's not it doesn't look like there's a cup in there there's a bandage he's got it ready to roll and then for whatever reason if this guy is an infantryman or combat arms of any sort he's got his flashlight on his right shoulder of his uh plc2 y straps this is a no-no especially if you're right-handed this guy could be left-handed so i could I, I might not you know judge he might be left-handed but if you're right-handed and you get your flashlight like that that is a no-no because it interferes with the shouldering of your rifle that's why it leads me to believe he could possibly be left-handed because he's got his first aid pouch, which actually doesn't get in the way because it's sitting up higher than his flashlight. So <clears throat> that's just something. Who knows? Um, I could be right. could be wrong. But for whatever reason, he's got it on there like that. Cool. And then you've got what appears to be the strap for the M... They're using M17 at that point, right? The gas mask? Or M17A1, something like that. I know you gas mask nerds tell me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure they're using the M17A1, right? But whatever. But the, anyway, the bag itself, you can see it kind of on the back, but that strap is pretty indicative. That didn't change in the later models, like for the M40. It looks like a gas mask bag strap. So he's got that strapped around his torso. And we move to the vest that he's wearing. So you can see that he doesn't have his, um, his blouse, like he's got the patch on, is underneath this Pazgit vest that's got this six color chocolate chip desert cover on it. Otherwise, you'd be able to see pockets, name tapes, possibly, and his rank. He's not wearing rank on the outside of his uniform, which is fine because your unit knows who's who and all that stuff. But if you're going with other units, it's kind of beneficial to wear rank. But whatever, they didn't think about that. And they're, these things are pretty expedient. you got to remember, the first or Desert Storm, the U.S. didn't have a lot of desert stuff stockpiled because we weren't really operating there. We did some stuff in Sinai in the 80s, but we generally weren't operating in the Middle East on the scale that we started to with De De Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. So there was a shortage, they caught up, and a lot of these active duty, you know, frontline units that were first deployed, rapidly deployed, they would have gotten a lot of the, the newest gear first, uh, the most flashy and stuff. But you see so many people wearing just the woodland pasket without the, the vest cover. And even in the, the, you know, Iraq War in 2003, you see people wearing uh, IBAs with woodland. It's mismatched colors. So anytime they get new equipment and stuff, it's it's just a weird supply system and not everybody is going to be wearing everything. That's why if somebody says there's only one correct way to wear a combat uniform, especially for the United States, they need to go back to school on the on the topic. So anyway, we'll go down. And you, got, you guys got the Pazgit vest, and then, of course, he's got the M16A2. He's got it broken down for field, he's field stripping. He's taking the bolt carrier group and the charging handle out of the upper receiver to clean that wonderful thing and make sure it's nice and nice and shiny and polished. But, yeah, I mean, the M16A2, that was the first time that was really used on a wide scale as well. They were still using A1s in um, a lot of non-combat arms units. They were still using units. They were using M16A1s. But the frontline units and the Marines and stuff are going to be issued the A2 most of the time. So that's probably why he's the 101st Airborne. He's got an M16A2. So he's breaking that down. Now let's look at his wristwatch. So he's got a wristwatch on. That's fine. He's wearing it a normal way, which is, I mean, again, it's 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 up to the individual soldier or Marine the way they wear their watch. And he's got that. But he's also got a compass on his wristwatch. So he's probably a, definitely a private purchase item. I don't think they issued those out. But he's got a compass on there, which is a pretty handy thing to have, even though it's a little compass. That's probably why he doesn't have a big compass in his uh, first aid pouch up there. But who knows about that? But yeah, he's definitely got a compass on his watch. You can see that. And we'll go down. And we've got the uh, we've got the uh, standard, you know, six color uh, pants, I guess. Uh, the BDUs, D DBDUs. So I really don't have to go on that. And then he's got the obviously the LC two ammo pouch sitting there with looks like he's full with 330 round mags so yeah he's gonna be wearing the lc2 setup which is pretty common and was worn up through you know the mid 2000s which is very interesting and now we'll go down to the bottom of the pants so you see how they look kind of weird they're not tucked into the boots it's because they have these things called um trouser blousing uh, things they look like a little rope with some hooks on it i never learned how to do those because we were just always told to tuck ours into our boots but the guys that are from this era Definitely use those. I guess they're more comfortable or something like that. But they do provide protection from creepy crawlies getting up in there, which is usually why you tuck your boots in or you know, do something to protect that. 
and it looks uniform and all that stuff. And then he's got some socks on that look like the standard issue socks. They're not white. Now, if you look at his footwear, you're going to be like, oh, that's that's not correct. It's They would have worn desert boots. Well, most of the time, like I was telling you, they have a lot of stuff ready for the desert. Most guys in Desert Storm, from the people that I know in person, which is quite a few because they're not that much older than me, um, they said that most of them were issued leftover Vietnam through the 80s production uh, jungle boots. So you're wearing this desert uniform, but you've got green and black boots on that gets very hot in the sun, but they're comfortable enough. And um, they're better than the just straight black leather ones. At least these breathe a little bit more. But the desert boots that they came out with with the, uh, with the Panama sole later on, that they had them, but not everybody got to wear them. So that, that was something that was really interesting that, you know, a couple years ago when I was on a reenactment Facebook group, uh, and, um, somebody, oh yeah, it was, it was Fargo Mark. Again, I'll bring you up. You, he posted a picture of himself in Desert Storm or Desert Shield and he was wearing jungle boots and they, the, some ex internet expert came out and said, oh, that's not correct. You need to have tan boots because you're in the desert. And he's like, well, this is actually from, you know, when I was there, so you can go pound sand. Anyway, yeah, so a lot of these green jungle boots were worn in the, or I keep saying the first Gulf War, that's how I was brought up, so I'm sorry, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, which is really interesting. You wouldn't think about that, but again, and he's sitting on his Alice pack, which is pretty cool, and he's got his E-Tool cover attached to his Alice pack somehow. It looks like it's kind of on its side, but anyway, so yeah, he's sitting on there. He's doing the old school, hey, throw your ruck down, sit on it, and get something done. Be productive even though you're sitting around. So, yeah, it's a really cool picture. It's very, it's so quintessential Desert Storm US. It is, this is about as good of a close-up picture of, and it's really clear too, of the gear, just kind of how it was worn, uh, the, just general things that a lot of this stuff carries over today, like sitting on your rock and doing all that. But, um, yeah, it's quintessential Desert, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Let me go over once more to see if I missed anything. <clears throat> so... Yeah, I think that's about it. Again, this one doesn't have a lot going on, but it also does have a lot going on because it's focused on the individual. There's a lot of these photographs that I analyze. There's more than one person in the photograph, so you kind of have to spend less time on each one analyzing and you kind of overlook things. This one, I think I got most of the details very standard. If he is an infantryman, which I, I pre probably is, uh, this is what the infantryman looked like during Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Just the standard LC2 gear, the Alice pack. He's probably got a bunch of other cool stuff in there. His mop gear is, you know, that could be a mop suit too on his on the bag around his shoulder or his torso. So I don't know, could be. But anyway, that's my once over. That's all I've got for this one. If I miss anything, again, let me know in the comments. If you learned something, let me know too. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, I always look at the comments and I see your suggestions. So whoever suggested Desert Storm, Desert Shield, thank you for that. It was more than one of you, so... I'll try to get to as many suggestions as possible. This is one of those conflicts that I know a little bit more about, so this is a little bit easier for me. But I've been doing some more difficult ones for me lately, which is really cool. I've been learning a lot from that, and we'll continue to kind of just... I want to try to cover as much as possible, and even things that I don't know about, just to observe and show you that nobody knows everything, and some people have their niches and all that stuff. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. I'd like to thank the sponsors of this video, my Patreon supporters and channel members. Yes, I like to be self and crowdfunded. It's really cool. So that way I don't have to shill for video games that I wouldn't actually recommend unless they were paying me. Stuff like that. Anyway, it's just a little bit of a joke. I mean, sponsorships aren't bad. It's just unless you believe 100% in what you're selling or, you know, advertising. I don't think you should really do it. But again, who am I? Anyway, that's my little whiny opinion on that. But uh, in all seriousness, my Patreon supporters and channel members... It allowed me to make so much really cool, expensive to produce uh, content. It allowed me to get some new gear like the lapel mic, which a lot of you complained that my sound was always bad because it wasn't the best, which you were correct. But this wasn't cheap, but it was totally easy to get it because I have um, so many generous people that are willing to support my work and believe in what I do. So thank you guys so much for that. If you want to do that, five bucks a month or more on either platform gets you to my Discord server, which is a really fun time. A lot of people on there, which is really cool. I never thought it would actually get to this level, but it has, and it's going to keep growing. So um, a lot of cool information is in there. I've learned a lot. It's fun, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to support me, but you can't do it financially, I, I totally get that. I understand that. You can support me by doing what the YouTube algorithm loves, liking this video by giving it a thumbs up, commenting below with what your thoughts were on this video, and subscribe to my channel if you haven't and sharing this video actually really does help out so if you want to support me but you can't do it with cash those are great ways to support me as well and 
If you don't want to support me at all, I hate to break it to you, but you already have because you watched it to this point in this video. So again, thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you on the next episode of analyzing historic photographs. I was going to say military history photographs because they're not going to be military. Analyzing historic photographs.